Hello. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yes, yes we yes, can. We can. Yes. Okay. Hello. Yes. Thank you everybody who has joined uh, on this uh, right on the dot for the time. Uh, so today we have uh, two interesting topics and before we start in case you don't know how to connect with us these are the different ways in which you can contact us uh, we usually have uh, all our meetups published on the meetup platform and we also have the SGMVP's youtube channel so i recommend that you have a look at this SGMVP's youtube channel it's not just the azure user group which is hosting uh, virtual meetups. We also have meetups uh, done by our colleagues from other platforms like data. AI team is doing a lot of uh, meetups off late and uh, office and the apps teams are also doing quite regular meetups and these are all posted on this uh, YouTube channel. And below I have the contact details of the organizers of this particular group in case you want to uh, contact us regarding any of the upcoming sessions or you want to present yourself some of the topics that you might be interested in. Uh, like for today's session, we were contacted by uh, the uh, guys uh, Nida and Tin. So before I start the session for today, uh, here are some of the interesting things happening next week, which uh, some of you might be interested in joining. There is a virtual conference which is happening uh, it's called the Light Up Virtual Conference. This is scheduled to happen on 14th of July. And this is to help the people uh, who are impacted by COVID-19. And uh, this is in support of the UNICEF. So some of us will be presenting as part of this uh, virtual conference. And I have the link here at the top in case you want to uh, register. You can also donate if you would like uh, to help those people who are impacted because of the uh, layoffs and things which are related to COVID-19. Uh, next on the list is uh, we have Donovan Brown. I'm sure most of you might have heard about him. In case you don't know who is Donovan Brown, he's the guy who coined this term about uh, DevOps. It's the union of people, processes and products to enable continuous delivery. He is a big, big name in the Microsoft world and he leads the DevOps efforts on the Microsoft side of things. So we have the great opportunity to have him uh, next week, 15th of July at 7 p.m. Uh, he is doing what is called as Ask Me Anything session. So there would be like a 15, 20 minutes initial uh, talk by Donovan and then uh, any question that he has from the audience, he'll be happy to answer that. So again, I recommend that you take this opportunity to interact with uh, Donovan Brown. So uh, with that, I would like to open today's session. So the first one we have is about uh, in-memory database using AKS ecosystem. We have uh, Nida and Tim uh, presenting this one. And after that, we will have Asif who will be continuing his uh, solution or the blockchain series. Today is the second part of his four part series. So before we start, here are some of the reminders. So please keep yourself on mute if you're not talking. If you have any questions, please uh, use the raise the hand feature of Microsoft Teams. Uh, this session will be recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, we would like to take them at the end of the session, at least for the first case. So with that, I think uh, Nida, you can start. OK. Hi, guys. Thank you, uh, Nilesh, for accepting us and to allow us to talk uh, in, the, in this meetup. OK, let's start. Good. Everyone sees my screen, right? Yes? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. We can see you. OK, you can still see me. OK, let me. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, you can. Better? Yes. Oh, OK, cool. Let me put this somewhere else. Voila, let's go. OK, uh, so to, today we'll, um, um, we'll tell you a story about uh, how we um, uh, used uh, AKS and how AKS was a uh, an excellent use case uh, for us to deploy um, our solution uh, for one of our uh, client who asked us to uh, build a prototype for them. 
So let me first of all um, introduce um, to the people who are going to speak. I'm here with uh, Tin. Tin is uh, my colleague. He's a senior co consultant at Activia. Yeah. Um, he's uh, the, the, Devo the DevOps guys of uh, our office here in Singapore. So he's based in Singapore, same as me. I'm here in Singapore for the past um, almost 10 years now. And I'm leading um, Active YAM technical team. Now let me tell you a bit more about the context and the, the use case of this uh, demo. Before uh, diving in this context, um, I need to introduce some uh, definitions. Um, so the context is we were like the one of the client we are working for is uh, a bank, uh, investment bank more precisely. And um, the domain of this bank, as you know, the bank has like could be on the retail side. This bank is on the like is our client on the investment side and more exactly on the market risk. What is a market risk? The market risk is like by having in, in short, by, by looking at some um, risk figures, uh, we can uh, anticipate, we can understand the risk of uh, losing money, losing positions that are related to multiple factors. So this is what market risk. And the risk figures that um, uh, risk managers are looking at are coming from what we call uh, a risk engine. This risk engine is a piece of software that uh, does a lot of math and provides um, risk figures that we uh, people at, at ActiveYAM site uh, ingest and add in our in-memory database. Um, another definition that you hear us um, mentioning a lot is um, the concept of book and the concept of trade. So the book in a bank, see it like a, um, a record where all the positions or the trades taken by a given trader or traders, dealers, they note all the uh, positions there, all the uh, details are, um, all the operations are in this, are um, entered, are booked in this book. And the granular, the, the let's say the um, granular piece, the, 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 the basic, um, the atomic object in that book, this is what we are referred to as a, as a position or trade. So this is basically like an, an exchange between two, between like the bank and a counterparty. Okay, so you have a concept of a book and a book inside the book, you have different uh, positions. I tried to, for the next slide to find an example, um, just for you to keep that in mind, like uh, if um, you transpose that, if you do an analogy of, um, of a, a championship of a football championship uh, you can see like uh, the the data that we have uh, by book level is for a given team uh, like the um, all the um, metrics or the kpis for the whole season if you want to deep dive and get more detail uh, so then you will focus on ma on one match so a match is like a trade um, the season stats for a given team is like having the data uh, at the book level. Okay. Hope that clarifies some of uh, the concepts. Um, let's move to the context. Uh, what we try to achieve and based on what our uh, client uh, asked us to do is to load data related to market risk coming from this uh, their risk engines. Um, and to load it in uh, Active Pivot. Active Pivot, I will give you quick insight about what it is. Um, it is an in-memory database that we are building. This is the piece of software that we do at Active Dam, and then we customize and then we, we deploy. Also, the client wanted to load 100 days of data. So it's a, like a huge set of data. I will give you detail about the volumes in the next slides. The end user, should like the risk manager or people taking some decision based on those risk figures should always be able to get to go up to the transaction detail. And at the same time, the client wanted us to minimize the hardware cost by using Microsoft uh, Azure. 
the way we did think, so I'm spoiling a bit, uh, is we, instead of loading data coming from the risk uh, engine at trade level, we were loading, we transformed that the data bit and we loaded at book level. Remember, trade level is a match, book level is the detail of the whole season. Okay, so we loaded data at book level, but that did, that it doesn't mean that we threw the data coming at trade level, we kept both data sets, the book level data set and the trade level data set. And when the end user wanted to see the detail of a given book, so then we load on demand the trade, the data coming at trade level. So this is why we kept the two data sets. You will see how for that on demand loading, we leverage it AKS and AKS was a um, um, really good for this use case. The high level architecture is the following. So let me put some pointer. You should by now see the laser pointer, okay? If you don't see it, I'm starting from the left side. So data is coming at trade level with those attributes. The format is CSV and we have a lot of those CSVs, okay? What we did is in a batch mode, we processed this data by doing a group by on some of those fields, which means of course, you transform the data from trade level, you aggregate it a bit, you group by on some attributes, and then you have data at book level. So we kept like CSV to CSV at this stage, nothing crazy. Of course, uh, attributes like trade ID or counterparty are no more available in this set of data. But we'll see how we can still get access to it. Then this data that is at book level is loaded within active pivot. So active pivot um, in, in, in our architecture is the back end, okay? This, um, this is the in-memory database that will ingest data, can ingest different type of data. And while ingesting the data, so it's a multi-dimensional database slash aggregation engine slash in-memory uh, database. Um, when we ingest the data, we can enrich it, we can add um, extra rules, we can um, um, cleanse it, etc. So we have like a pre-processing type of uh, stage, stage while ingesting the data. We have the aggregation, so this is something that we customize with the API. We say, okay, I want to look at this risk figure, but this risk figure, I want it to be like an average or mean or max, etc. We can um, um, do some aggregation function, attach some aggregation functions to um, uh, the numerical value that are coming into this um, database. And also we can add um, complex, what we call like complex measures, which means like we um, post process, we post aggregate um, the, like we, we create aggregates on top of the existing aggregates. I don't know if like, um, uh, if we go back to our use case of the uh, football, um, um, matches, you can aggregate, um, like you can have like a ratio like related to the accuracy. Okay, so this ratio is not, you don't have it. Uh, you can, you have like all the miss, like all, all the, um, you know, shots and mi mi missed. Um, and then you do like uh, the ratio, for instance, on the total. So this is something you can do and you can do much more complexity and in terms of um, uh, post-processing, but I won't detail that at this stage. Back end active pivot, front end is what you're gonna see is called like active UI. So this is the UI that is, this is a presentation layer only. Heavy lifting remains here. Presentation layer allows you to browse your data, slice and dice, build dashboards, build reports. This is what we are going to use in the, um, in, in the demo. Those two um, pieces of software as I mentioned, Active Pivot is like totally written by us, like our product center is in Paris and uh, New York. So Active Pivot is written in Java, comes with its own API that allow you to do what I mentioned previously. And Active UI also um, comes with its own API, but this um, presentation layer is written with uh, JavaScript and React and the API allows you to customize um, the look and feel and adding more, um, maybe like 
as you're gonna see some like um, context menu um, context menu entries and connect to uh, third party services etc um, data specification and volume um, what we were dealing with is the following we had two million trades for each day in the in, in this market risk use case every day you will have two million trades and you like you will have you reprise them every day okay so two million trade for per day every trade has like what we refer to as 10 risk classes see it like uh, the different factors that might impact uh, this trade and allow you to uh, generate some uh, risk figures based on those risk classes so 2 million trades times 10 risk classes times 100 dates because we this was uh, the initial use case we want to have 100 dates uh, available to the end user in short 2 billion records imagine a huge csv with 2 billion records All this is, um, like we behind the scene, we have 2,000 books. The, the bank is managing 2,000 books for this um, uh, business. The, the, if you recall, when I was explaining the schema, the high-level schema, I told you that data comes at trade level, and then we reduce, we do some group buy. So you will see here the impact of the group buy. So when you have a data at trade level, its size on the disk is at 8 terabyte when you for 100 days, the total set. When you reduce it, it becomes 18 gigabyte. So a decent laptop can load this data, and which means you can make the data available, 100 days available to your business users by loading this reduced data. But now the equation, the rest of the equation is how can I load the details? So let me show you that um, running on my laptop first, and then you will see it running on AKS. Let's pray the God of Demo, and let's go. Okay. You all must see my screen. Let me know if you don't see Active UI. Okay. I'm connecting to Active UI. This is the front end I was mentioning. Now, behind the scene, what I did is I loaded data in, in what we refer to as a data, like in memory database, but we, we call it a cube. So everything is loaded in this, um, the, 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 the data at book level has been loaded in this uh, cube, this uh, book level cube. Let's see how usually the people will look at it. They will take like some metrics this is like a, a metric relevant for uh, risk managers, for instance. You can um, look at that. You can come here, slice and dice, drop down, and you see that metric uh, broken by uh, long, long this, what we refer to as a hierarchy. Fine. So if I take only the books here, so I have this value, this value along all the books, and then I loaded few dates. So if I put my dates here, so I can say, this is, I'm seeing this um, risk figures that uh, it's named like VAR 95. I see it by for those dates and for those books. Say I'm the end user and now I'm interested. I don't have the details of the transaction here. And I'm interested to see, okay, what is the detail of um, book nine? I right click. And as you can see here, I filled book nine from that coordinate of that cell. Now I will pick up the existing, um, some of the existing dates. And when I push the select button, behind the scene what happens is I'm sending, there is a, a piece of code that we wrote, will be detailed by Tin later on, that receives this request of, hey, I want book nine for the 31st and for the 30th, and please load that for me and load me the details. So the set of data that is loaded now is the data at trade level. I'm loading the matches. Here I'm having the season. Here I'm having on the right, I'm having the matches. So now I can deep dive in book nine only. 
as you can see, if you pay attention to the name of the cube here, it's not the same. If I'm selecting the right widget, I see the name my cube trade level with the two dates. If I select the left widget, I'm back to the my cube book details. And guess what? My cube book details, you can see that those are the, the, the axis that I can use for my analysis. But when I click to the other widget, widget I have more access because I loaded the data at trade level. And now I can put the same values. Let's say I still put var 95. I don't need the counts. I put um, the booking. I don't need to put them because I, I'm focusing on book nine. But I can access more data. I can access the counterparties. I can access the IDs of the transactions. And etc. So I can do um, a deeper analysis that um, the other uh, database, because it has been loading data at book level, does not allow me to do. And if I want to see the top of the house here, the value 85k, let me put the date, sorry, here in the columns, okay. If I look at the top of the house on the 31st, 85k, this is for like the total, so it is exactly the same value that I see here, which makes sense. It should be exactly the same because from this value, imagine that I did, I, like I was zooming, I, 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 I get all the underlying data and I load it somewhere else. Okay. So now at this stage, you can say, now I want to hear more about the cloud. So I will let Tin detail what we did uh, on the cloud part. Tim, the stage is yours. I stop sharing. <clears throat> Thank you, Nita. Uh, let me share my desktop here. Okay, tell me if you see my screen. Yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, I hope everybody is having, having a good time. So we have a long weekend ahead. The weather is quite good. All right. So, um, so by now, I think you have some uh, ideas of uh, our our solution, our design of our solution, and the the problem that we are trying to achieve. So uh, we have this uh, particular uh, problem for the client. So we designed this solution, and as Nita mentioned, so we try to uh, prove the solution theoretically uh, how we can implement in the laptop first. So at this point of time, we have no deployment on the any server or any cloud platform. So we are only playing around with the, uh, a small set of data within our laptop only. So now I think we know that our solution is working. So this is the time that we need to show the client that, okay, our solution, we can use one of the <clears throat> cloud platform uh, one of the cluster management management uh, solution uh, to deploy our solution and then to showcase that this is uh, achievable. So what we did was uh, uh, the client was also agree on that uh, using the Azure platform. So what we we did uh, a few a bit of a research on the Azure platform, and then we found out that okay, there's uh, something called AKS. So. <clears throat> The long form is the Azure Kubernetes service. So it's a it's a fully managed uh, Kubernetes service. So it's a, one of the product of the Azure platform, and it's a free cluster management. What I mean by that is, um, if you use the service AKS to create your cluster, to create your Kubernetes cluster on the Azure platform, they will not charge you for this service. But you have to know that. To use the cluster, you need to use other resources. For example, you need to select the virtual machine. You need to provision the appropriate virtual machine for your application to deploy. And you also need to provision some kind of storage or network services. So, <clears throat> so those components, these are also all available on the Azure platform. So of course, you have to pay for that one only, so which means we are ready to start using the Azure Kubernetes, so we decided to go on with that one. So the second step for us is to 
you see, a virtual machine. So as we mentioned before, our application is a Java API with the web services. So definitely we can use the Linux machine. Or if you want to use Windows machine, that is also available. So if you look around the Azure virtual machine services, they provide quite extensive list of the uh, different tiers and different virtual machine types. So they are mainly like a standard type or memory optimized type. Or if you need more CPU power, you can choose the CPU optimized type, etc. So they have a different type of a billing system. And the good thing is they are based on the usage, so per second usage billing. So later we will show you uh, the, the breakdown of the cost structure. So for our case, um, I think DCD is usually for the standard types. So if you're not sure yet, you can start with the standard type D series. So it's a small virtual machine type. And then for our case, we are more memory optimized type of an application, which means we need more memory. We don't need much of the computing power. So we choose the E series for the memory optimized fashion. So later I will show you the details of um, which virtual machine type we use and why do we use it. The second most important part for us, <clears throat> so as we mentioned before, so we have uh, our client provide us uh, the huge details of the CSV fine set of data for all of their DDs, trade data and book data. So I think this is interesting here. So if you are in the Kubernetes uh, <clears throat> cluster wall, you have um, in the Azure platform, you have a quite different types of the storage option. So I won't go into the details of all the types of that one. For example, you can choose a blob storage, you can choose the fine share storage, etc. And for our case, um, there's a something called Azure Fines. So that is like a, it's a cloud fine share system, so which is very much uh, compatible with the Kubernetes service as well. So this is very similar to your local fine system storage. So you, you all know that um, if I store all my data on my laptop, so I can browse my application or I can browse my file storage using the different folder, kind of like a tree structure. So if I convert that into the cloud storage, actually they maintain that kind of structure, which is quite easy for us to manage, which means even if my application even was assessing the same data in the cloud, I can still see the exactly the same structure of the data. So later I will show you in the Azure portal uh, how we can browse to that one. And the second most important part is, uh, I think depends on the storage uh, option, they have some uh, traits and pros and cons. So one of the biggest advantages for using the Azure Fine Share is they allow you to use them, um, they allow you to share between the multiple virtual machine. So what I mean by that is, um, so we have, imagine that you have a, we try to uh, provision multiple virtual machines. So some of our application will be one virtual machine, the other application will be the, you know, the new virtual machine, etc. But if we keep all our fine within the Azure file share, so no matter which virtual machine you are on, you can share the same set of the Azure file share. Of course, you have to configure a bit uh, to be able to communicate with the Kubernetes. But once you have done that, it's quite a lot uh, transparent in your Kubernetes structure. So later I will show you that one. So this is the Azure. This is not the extensive list of the uh, Azure services. Of course, we also use some type of a load balancing and other network services, etc. But this is like uh, the main component we have to decide to use <clears throat> once we uh, when we decided to migrate our application to the uh, Azure Kubernetes. So let me give you the uh, bit of an um, architecture overview of this uh, entire application, especially when we deploy it on the Azure Kubernetes. So this the uh, so I draw the line here. This is a boundary of the uh, Azure AKS ecosystem. So this entire structure, this is within the Kubernetes cluster. So whichever I, I whichever item I draw here. They reside 
in the Kubernetes system. So let me start by the, the bottom part. So I call it Kubernetes volumes. So remember that I mentioned that, uh, so we first we upload all our detailed trade data files into the Azure Financial. So Azure Financial is a separate service. It is not part of the Kubernetes system. So if we want our application within the Kubernetes to access the Azure Financial, we need to speak the Kubernetes language. So for the Kubernetes, they have something called Kubernetes volumes. So no matter which storage option, from the Kubernetes point of view, it is assumed as a Kubernetes volumes. So what we have to do is we have to mount our Azure function as part of the uh, Kubernetes volumes. So that way, any application that we deploy within the Kubernetes system, they can access our function through the Kubernetes volumes. So this is just a configuration part only. I won't go into today, but this is the architecture overview of that one. So I will just tell you that, okay, we have the function. We have to mount our function as a Kubernetes volume types. So let's start from the left side here, so this one. So we mentioned to you that we have an active UI JavaScript kind of a web application. So this is our UI application. So of course, the first thing, Once the user log into our Active UI application, so the first thing that they will see is uh, our summary application, so with the summary level data. So we call it book level queue because this application, it, uh, it, it can only contain the book level data without the details tree data. So this application, it will try to access to the same Kubernetes volume here. So it will read the CSV file related to the book level then it will display the uh, summary level data to the user. So that is step one. Let me remove all this. Okay. So the second part, so let's say the user look into the book level details. At this point of time, the user got interested in one of the metrics. So let's say book one. So he was interested in one of the metrics, one of the numbers or uh, value at risk number. So if he was interested in that one, he wanted to see the details of the differences or the group of that particular matrix. So now he need to know the he need the breakdown of that particular uh, data. So of course, he will request using right click uh, load on demand request. So that request will go to this part, the launcher. So the launcher is nothing but just a simple Spring Boot application. So it has an API to create another TDS level application within the Kubernetes port on demand. So it will take uh, usually to create a new uh, Kubernetes port, it will take like 10 to 15 seconds. And if you add up the data loading time of like a few seconds, so this uh, entire process of loading the on demand queue, it will take under 20 to 25 seconds. So it's kind of like a quite, um, from the user perspective, it looks really um, real time. So they don't need to wait a long time. They don't need to request someone. They just right click, wait for a few seconds, and then the, the DT queue will be appear. So the same queue will be connected from the active UI. So the same active UI that they are looking at, they can show, they can see the DDS data at this point. So later I will show you the demo, and then I think on the demo, it will be much more clear. So once again, although this separate application we created on demand, they are still requesting the same data from the same financial system. So that's the advantages of the Kubernetes. So we can deploy anything on the within the cluster, and then we can back run the same Kubernetes volume, and that volume can connect to the your existing financial. So they will all be they will all have access, reassess, write access, whichever you configure. So I hope that gives you the, a bit of a clear idea of the overview of the architecture. So before we uh, dive into the details of that one, I think uh, some of you will be, you will, we have a development, some of you will be developer, and some of you may have the Kubernetes development experience. So let me give you our development steps. 
So we have a two development stack. One is called application development, the other one is called the uh, Kubernetes development. So let me start from the application development side. As you can imagine, we have a Java API. Our application, our MMO database was implemented using plain Java. And we have the API and web service in the Java. So before all the cloud platforms came into the picture, of course, like everybody else, what we did was we create our Java application. We package as a WAR file. And then of course, we try to deploy it on the Tomcat or any of the Java web server. So that was and that was how we have um, how we used to deploy. So now that we need to move our application into the Kubernetes world. So the first step that we did, we move our we convert our Java plain Java application into the Spring Boot. So if you haven't heard of the Spring Boot, I think you might heard of the Spring Framework. I think a lot of Java developers use the Spring Frameworks. So Spring Boot is um, coming from the Spring Framework. They are mainly for the standalone Spring application, which means instead of uh, creating the WAR file and then doing the deployment on the Tomcat or Jetty, so they try to embed your web server. So what happens is in the end, your entire application began one single Jar file. So your entire uh, web server is embedded inside the Jar file. So you don't need to manage all of these steps. So your application is simply fine into one single Jar file. So this is a prerequisite for the Docker or Kubernetes world. And of course, most of the people we know Spring Boot as a very powerful auto configuration. So we used to deal with the XML file or a lot of the configuration file. So from the Spring Boot, they try to use a lot of the annotation. So using the annotation, we can configure our application quite easily. So the first step, we move our Java application into the Spring Boot application. And then the next steps. So before I move on to that one, so our idea is we need to convert our application into one single Docker container. Of course, like everybody has, <clears throat> what we did was uh, we tried to manually create the Docker files. We tried to configure our Spring Boot Abric Jar file to be able to run into the uh, Docker files. So that is that was like um, before we found out that we can use another thing called GIB chip, Maven container and Maven plugin. So this Maven plugin, why do we use it? So it is one of the GitHub project from the Google. It's an open source project. It provides the Maven or Grader. If you're using Grader, you can also use a plugin. So the good thing is you can easily integrate your Spring Boot application with the uh, JIT Maven. And the JIT Maven will help you create the Docker image. Basically, it will help you convert your Spring Boot Java file into the Docker image. So what is good about that one? So of course, they have a lot of experience on the container application. So they try to apply the um, a lot of the best practice for using the Docker image. So the output Docker image will be well optimized image. And you don't need you don't even need to provide the Docker files. It can understand the Spring Boot your Spring Boot project, and then it based on that, it can create the optimized application. The other part is, if you don't use that one, if you want to manually convert your Spring Boot chart into the um, Docker image, you, you need to install Docker. You need to have the Docker demo. Then if you if you have some experience with the Docker image, I think you have to build some command like a Docker P, and then it will, have a, it will generate the Docker image. So all of these things, the JIT will get rid of all of this. You don't even need to install the Docker. You just run the Maven command of the JIT, and then it will generate the Docker image. So this part really uh, smooth the, the process of converting your uh, traditional Java application and do all the way into the Docker image. So the second part, okay, so now that you have the Docker image, so what about the Kubernetes? So Kubernetes, for the Kubernetes, you can just deploy, upload your Docker image into the Kubernetes. So Kubernetes has a, its own language of deployment. So before we know about this package manager called Helm, of course, we manually try to 
like everybody else, we manually tried, I manually tried to deploy my Docker image. I use a kubectl command and try to manually set up the port YAML file, deployment YAML file. I think at least you need like two or three different configuration YAML file to properly deploy your Docker image into the Kubernetes. If you have only one application, of course, this doesn't look like much of an issue. But once you have like multiple application, multiple application to deploy or upgrade, you kind of end up doing a lot of this thing manually. So instead, you can use a Kubernetes package manager called HAM. It will manage that complexity part of a deployment step. And also it will, it will allow you to create the something called HAM chart. So your application became one of the HAM chart. So that HAM chart, if you use the HAM CLI, so you can say like HAM install, and then it will know how to package your application, and then it will know how to deploy to your Kubernetes. And the best part is, the next time if you want to change something in your application, it is, it is very easy to upgrade your existing HAM chart just by changing the your Docker image tag. So that is quite a lot of uh, time saving. So easy upgrade and share. You, of course, you can share your HAM chart with the other people as well. So this part, I think not a lot of people will know that one. So remember that um, I think for most of the people, they, they only need to do deployment at one time at the beginning. So you do the HAM deployment, you do the Kubernetes deployment, and then that's it. But for our special case, what we are trying to achieve is we are trying to create, we are trying to do the deployment on demand. So that means at the runtime, I need to do the Kubernetes deployment at the runtime. So I need to call this HAM API from my Java application. So that's why I need the Java API for HAM. So this is called microbean. You for me, I tried to find, I thought there would be quite a lot of choice for Java API for the HAM, but unfortunately there's only one or two GitHub project. <clears throat> so this one is quite popular one, Microbean HAM. So it will expose the Java API and then it can call, it can it can interpret all the HAM command. So using this one, our launcher application, we can deploy the HAM application. So I give you the URL for that project as well. So for us, we try to contribute that project. We try to create the issue. We try to create the. We try to request a new feature, etc. Last but not but not least, so this is called. This is one of the another Google project called Scaffo. <clears throat> so if you remember that, um, so I mentioned that. Okay, starting from the Java application, we move into Spring Boot. We create the Docker image. We create the Helm. It seems like there's a quite a lot of steps involved. So if you're only doing one or two deployment, which is okay, you can still do that. But imagine that you are continuously developing, you are continuously changing your application, and you want to see the your changes right away within second deploying in your Kubernetes, then that a lot of step can be automated. We call it pipeline. So this pipeline can be automated using the Scrap 4. So Scrap 4 is just a client side library only, which means you don't need to install Scaffo in the Kubernetes. You just need to deploy it, uh, install it in your local development machine. So it will handle all kinds of the Docker image touching and invoking the JIP Maven plugin. It will detect your Java code changes. So all of this tagging, handling, and all the way to the deployment to your cluster, it will take, <clears throat> take care of that one. So that is really time saving for us. So this is like debugging, but okay, so okay, development, deployment, which is all good. But as we all know, when 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 you deploy something, there's a, something is always going wrong. So this is where this uh, debugging part is came in very handy. So <clears throat> you don't even uh, so you don't need to implement uh, de develop your application in the Visual Studio Code. Uh, Virtual Studio Code, Virtual Studio Code, but if you use the Virtual Studio Code, and if you install the uh, Kubernetes plugin, they give you a very good, um, easy to debug tool 
for your Kubernetes. So using this tool, you can easily uh, assess your Kubernetes cluster. So later I will show you this one. I will show you the hands-on details of how to use this one. So let's do the demo. So before we do the demo, let me walk you through our Azure portal. So this is the Azure portal. You can create your Azure account, which is a free. And you can start creating your Kubernetes. So for us, we create our Kubernetes cluster. And in here, we install, uh, we provision a few uh, virtual machine in here. So this is done in here. And then the next thing I want to show you is uh, storage. So I mentioned that, okay, we set up the file shell. And then of course in here, we are using this particular folder for 100 days of data. So we have the trick level data, <clears throat> book level data uploaded into this Azure file shell. So as I mentioned before, this is just CSV file with the file stretcher, which is quite similar to your local file system. So I can, for each state, I can log into the particular directory, etc. So this is how we maintain our, how we uh, store our application into the Azure file shell. And before we move on to here, let me give you the first use to your code. So this is what I'm talking about regarding the debugging. So you can community version, just a community version, Visual Studio Code. And then if you go to the extension, just touch the Kubernetes. This is a plugin for the Kubernetes. So I, I have already set up that one, so I can install it. What happened is if I install that one, and I just connected, I already set up to connect to my cluster. So this library, this plugin, it will give you the entire cluster management view right within your Visual Studio Code. So at the moment, I have already installed the three ham chart. So one is a book level, the other one is a UI, our active UI, and this one is called the our launcher application. And then if you can see it, this is called Node. So Node is like a, <clears throat> your virtual machine. So this, you can see the virtual machine that we have provisioned within our <clears throat> Kubernetes. And the most important part is the workloads. <clears throat> so of course, once you install the HAM chart, so the HAM chart will take care of installing your Kubernetes port. So here, so we have three Kubernetes ports each one representing the different application, UI, Launcher, and Kubebook. Let's go to the UI. So let me show you the demo. So I log into the Edit UI. So the first thing that I see is a book level <coughs> data. So this is the summary data that we are talking about. So we don't see a lot of details, but we can see the whole 100 days of data and then all the 2,000 books available here and the interesting, our interested uh, metrics. So let's say I'm interested in this, um, let me put something, let me choose something randomly, risk 37. So I'm interested in this uh, date uh, number metrics differences. So now I want to see the DD of that one. I will load the, I, will, I want to see the difference between the 26th and 25th. So let me load that one. So what is happening right now, if I refresh the cluster, so our application is trying to <clears throat> provision a new trick level TTS data. So that's why you can see the cube uh, ham chart here. And then under the ports, it is creating a new application, a new uh, trick level port. So within 20 seconds, now we can see the data. So remember from here, we only see the book level data, but just now I on demand, I requested a new trick level application. So now we can see the DT of the data. So this is the DTS we uploaded. Uh, so we initiated our trick level details for this particular book, risk 37, for two days. So now I can <clears throat> dive into the details of the data for this too. 
So if you look into the content editor, so our RTT line can connect to the book, uh, book level and also trade level. So now that I'm connected to the trade level, I can see all the all the way until the trade information, trade details, etc. And imagine like okay, so now everything is working. But imagine like although you're trying to load the data, your cube is failing. So what can I do? I can quickly check the log. If you right click on this cube, on this particular port, you have a bunch of options available from the Kubernetes. If you click the follow log, you can see all the, the latest logs of your application. So easily you can see the logs from here. And if you want more than that, I can even SSH into this particular application. So this is my uh, cube, uh, trade details cube. And I know that my application is using app.log as an application log point. Even check the entire logs. So I can do, uh, I can SSH into any of the port from here. So that's how easy when you use the Kubernetes um, plugin from the Fashio Studio. It's not, this is not the only solution. You can use the uh, default uh, web dashboard from the Kubernetes. But to me, I think this is more closer to the developer, so you can easily, you know, SSH or you can check the everything inside here. So if I'm using the deployment here, I can check the details of the deployment. If I click here, they will give you the live version of the YAML configuration file. So I hope you have a good understanding of our how we deploy our application. So now let me give you the resource utilization. So this way wrap up why we choose this solution. So initially we have a book level DD. So 18 gigabyte, we need memory of 8.5 gigabyte. This is not a problem. We can uh, deploy this type of data, this type of memory in any of the laptop. So this is good. But the problem is, let's say, so our client, they wanted to see the trade level DD as well. So they don't mention any books. They want like 2,000 books, 100 days, any kind of DD, whatever, whenever they want, they want to see that. So to be able to accomplish that, we need the data size of 8 terabyte, which is okay, which is not expensive, but the memory, 1.6 terabyte. This is a problem came in. So instead of doing that one, what we did was we slice our data into the small set of that one. So as you can see in the demo, the user only right click on one particular book. So we will only look for that single book and for that uh, particular specific two or three days. So we can reduce down into 800 megabyte of <clears throat> memory. So this is like very small memory. So this is like a port. I think any decent machine can load multi-bay application of that level. The one million record, and the loading time is also become four seconds. So because of this small set of data, we can real time, we can give the real time uh, on demand access. So of course in the Kubernetes war, this trade level queue, we convert it into the one single port. <clears throat> so whenever the user requests book level TDA, uh, trade level TDA for a particular board, we create a new port. So that port, it will have a 1.6 gigabyte RAM, which is quite okay. And then the data loading time is only four seconds. But of course, <clears throat> as you understand, uh, the container creation time. So after the container create, they need to start the embedded Tomcat server, and they need to start our Spring Boot application. So all this um, <clears throat> extra loading time, it will be like 10 seconds or 15 seconds. Depends on how well you can optimize. So overall, and at 30 seconds, we can promise that you say, okay, if you want to see the DDS data, within 30 seconds, we can load your data within 30 seconds. Just for this figure, so before we uh, design the application, we try to find the uh, Sava. We try to find the Sava uh, to be able to host the 1.6 terabyte memory of that one. So this is like from the Lenovo website. So we try to configure one of the Sava machine. Of course, although two terabyte, we only need two, two terabyte. We need some headroom for the server maintenance and OS, etc. So we just simply try to 
configure into 4 terabyte, 4 terabyte RAM, and then we end up with 150K. So this is like a huge amount for the server. So instead of that, we choose the Kubernetes uh, solution on the Azure platform. And then as I mentioned, we choose the memory of the MyC theory. You don't have to choose it for you. You can choose uh, whichever option that are relevant to you. So for the memory optimized series, we have uh, quite a few options. So for us, we are mainly interested in this part. So they are rel relatively cheap. They are part of our charges is like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, etc. So you can see the full list of TD and this link on the Azure website. So for our uh, book level cube, we choose we provision one virtual machine of E4S V3, so 32 gigabyte, which is good enough for our book level cube, book level application. But for our on demand three level application, we choose 128 gigabyte of machine. So that machine, you can imagine like we can easily allocate 50 ports. So which means the user can uh, select like 50 books and they can see the TD of 50 books. So this is like soft limit only. If we want to allocate 100, we can just easily uh, scale our Kubernetes into two virtual machine of this type. And then we can quickly um, allocate 100 uh, pause of the TDs. So this is the advantages of the elasticity elast of the Kubernetes. So just a comparison. So if we look at this figure, and let's say if we run this application for the whole year, 10 hour a day, our price will become 3,000, 3, something 3,000. So of course, compared to 160K, this is like a lot less. And of course, the whole uh, control, this is under our full control, which means we can change the virtual machine size or the type at any time. So, Anita, uh, I will let yep. you conclude that one. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, okay. Back on track. You see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay, uh, as Tim mentioned, here we... Um, so, let's conclude. So, um, yeah. So, um, Tim walked you through um, all what implemented on the um, Azure side by using AKS, which here, as you can see, AKS is um, is really uh, interesting for this use case because this is how the cloud. Remember, first time you told about the cloud is you can use as many machines as you want. You shut down the machine when you don't need it. So this is a, a relevant use case for that. So instead of buying a machine that worth um, almost 200k um, USD, you can just use only what you need and the day you want to move from small to medium to big, just provision more. Uh, no need to tell you that some industries they have, and maybe for other big corp, uh, to, pro to provision hardware, sometimes you, you wait like three to six months. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, three weeks or sometimes like three months, you know. Um, I'm, I'm talking about like my own experience with banks, like it's very complex to get hardware. So here, relying on the cloud is very, very um, interesting. Um, but the use case need to um, fit in that in, in that uh, context. Um, if uh, in our case, loading things, loading details, loading trade level data um, will uh, take uh, one hour, then maybe the end user won't accept that. So also, um, the interesting part is the technology you're using should allow you to load fast, um, to destroy fast what you don't need. And if it comes with an, its own API and it's extendable, like what we did with our own components, that could help. And this paradigm, you can apply it not only for our technology, but you, you can apply it and to other technologies. Um, what else? Yeah. Last but not least, really to finish, um, ActiveYAM, we are 140 plus um, um, people around the globe, five locations. Um, 
we've been in, in the technology and focusing on our product, which is um, this in-memory database that we call Active Pivot for the past 15 years. Recently, we released a new um, product named Atoti, the one you see here. You can, if you get the QR code, you will get the, the website uh, of the Atoti. This is um, allows you to leverage the power of Active Pivot by writing Python. You write Python, uh, you have actually a community edition, so you can start using the tool tonight if you want to spend some time and doing like a coding party. Um, and you leverage uh, active uh, pivot within your uh, Jupyter notebook. That's it for us. Please shoot if you have any questions. Thanks, Nida. Thanks, Tin. Uh, it's a wonderful session. Uh, looks quite an interesting use case. So, uh, anybody from the uh, attendees, do you have any question? You can unmute yourself and ask the question. I had one question. Uh, if uh, someone is still thinking about presenting there or asking this question, I had this around. Uh, you know, I've been working on big data for quite some time, and there are some file systems or file types uh, which are optimized for analytics use cases. So your use case is also somewhat similar to doing analysis on large volumes of data, right? Uh, did you consider changing from CSV file format to something like uh, compressed file formats mm -hmm. or optimized file formats like Parquet or ORC? Actually, the next, um, I'll take this one, the next level of, of this proof of concept um, is using, uh, because the client is, um, of course, what we showed you is uh, see the see it like the first stage of the of, of the proof of concept. Uh, once we had like the approval for them from them to carry on, so the next level is yeah, they are now um, using Parquet as format. Okay. okay. But at the end of the day, uh, Parquet for small like will 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 give you um, um, advantage. We can load Parquet, of course, but it gives you advantage you as as an end user to pay maybe less for the for the storage, because uh, yeah, Parquet is very very uh, um, excellent format for compression. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks for answering that. Uh, anyone else has any question? If not, then Nida and Tin, thank you. Thank you for this session. And I thank think you. thank you very can, much. Yeah. Thanks for the answer. It Tim. was great having you here. So let's open the floor for Asif to start his session. Yeah. Thanks, Nilesh. Thanks, Nida and Tin. Yeah, yeah. session. Okay, I'll share my screen now. Nilesh, are you able to see my screen? Oh, yes. See. Yeah, we can see your screen as if. Oh, okay, thank you. Hi, thanks for everyone uh, for joining today. Uh, thanks, Nida and uh, Tin for a wonderful session. And uh, thanks, Nilesh, for organizing this session. So today I'm going to speak on the topic of uh, blockchain again. So it's uh, part two of the blockchain series, which I'm talking about. In uh, part one, we have already covered in, uh, in Azure UG May. So if you haven't uh, misattended that or missed that session, so you can uh, just go into the Microsoft Azure UG, uh, Microsoft User Group Singapore and uh, can see here uh, in May meetup. So this session is available here. Okay, so please subscribe this channel. Uh, all our videos are available on this session, on this channel. Okay, so let's start uh, with the uh, blockchain part two. Bit about myself. Uh, I'm a Mohammed Asif. I'm a solution architect at Ibnamro Bank, and uh, this is the roadmap for a blockchain four-part series we are doing. 
In part one, we have covered uh, some blockchain fundamentals and different framework available for blockchain development and some tools. And we have also seen uh, means how we can create a blockchain infrastructure uh, by using Microsoft Azure and uh, how we can create a consortium. So in part two, we'll create a blockchain prototype by using Azure Workbench and deploy the prototype on uh, blockchain Azure as a service. So before starting, uh, if you haven't, uh, means as I told before, uh, if you haven't go through that uh, blockchain fundamentals and uh, what are the different type of frameworks, so you can go through part one, but uh, we will also cover uh, some recap of uh, part one in this few minutes. Okay, in part three, we will also, we'll go for uh, is deploying the application by using CI/CD pipelines and generating the REST APIs, how we can integrate the data integration capabilities. Like suppose if you have any existing app and you want to integrate that existing app to your blockchain application. So we will see all the possibilities and we will also see that uh, how we can publish the code on a blockchain network. In path four, uh, it will be last part of the series so we will see how we can send the data by using serverless functions like azure uh, functions and uh, logic apps or uh, power apps so how we can trigger the actions because uh, microsoft azure is providing uh, ethereum connectors so we'll see how we can leverage uh, ethereum connected to push the data into the sql server database or cosmos db so yeah so this is today's agenda. So in first we'll see uh, what are the Azure blockchain services available, and then we'll see how we can uh, configure our Azure Workbench and deployment. Some of the part of Azure Workbench uh, we have already covered in part one, but uh, I will go through uh, quickly and uh, we'll try to go in more deep dive in terms of uh, technical uh, deep dive how we can configure uh, Azure Workbench and what are the things we need to consider. And when we are going uh, for uh, developing a blockchain app from scratch and uh, what's the difference between uh, means creating a smart contract for Azure Workbench. So these all possibilities we'll see today and how we can deploy an app. So in part one, we have seen, uh, suppose if you want to start any blockchain project or any uh, blockchain app prototype, so what are the things you need to consider? So what are the challenges we have in our uh, means blockchain development to start a blockchain development? So basic things are like uh, how we are going to uh, integrate with your current existing app, how you're going to create an infrastructure because you want to create a simple app. And uh, for creating a simple app, we have to manage, suppose if you have to manage API management, orchestrate of your all signing, hashing, and routing capabilities, and uh, or handling all the messages, deploying the ledger, writing the business logic, or uh, integrating with existing apps, linking your uh, federated identities, like suppose if you have any applications on uh, AWS and you want to integrate with your Azure. So all such things uh, miss it's a really uh, big task for just to start a simple blockchain prototype. So in that scenario, uh, Microsoft is providing a couple of services. Uh, one of them is called Azure Workbench. Azure Workbench is very helpful in terms of uh, creating a blockchain prototype. And uh, you don't need to worry about the infrastructure part. You don't need to worry about the UI part. You just need to uh, write the business logic and uh, you can deploy a blockchain uh, on the blockchain workbench. Uh, blockchain workbench also, uh, there is a second is uh, Azure Blockchain as a Service. So Azure Blockchain as a Service is, a, you can say, a kind of enhancement for uh, Azure Workbench. It provides uh, you a capability for scale up your network, uh, for adding your more transaction node or uh, capturing the data from multiple sources. So we'll, Going forward, we'll see uh, what are the actual differences between both of them. And uh, there is also services for Azure Data Manager. So Data Manager is helpful in terms of cases like, uh, suppose if you are handling uh, multiple uh, data sources and getting a lot of data like IoT data, or uh, you have a, some Facebook or Twitter application and you are getting unstructured data. Okay, so you want to handle such data. So there is a, Azure Data Manager. 
so you can uh, leverage Azure Data Manager capabilities to push the data into Azure Workbench or Azure uh, Blockchain as a service. And uh, for a uh, fourth service is basically the Azure Token Services. So Azure Token Services is a kind of uh, you want to tokenize your uh, digital tokens or uh, assets. So that is very helpful. Yeah. So basically today we'll uh, see how we can create a prototype by using Azure Workbench. So this is the challenges basically in the current scenario we have like uh, you want to create a POC and you should have a like month of uh, development time. You have to create your own infrastructure and uh, difficult to connect your existing infrastructure, spending all time for the infrastructure, no time for writing the business logic and sensitive data for your unsecured platform. Suppose you, if you're writing a, a blockchain app on Ethereum or some any open source block, open source or blockchain network. So data security is also a big concern and uh, you want to develop an API to manage access to blockchain consortium network in case like uh, suppose if you are developing a blockchain application on Ethereum and uh, so to connect to the blockchain network, you need to have uh, some middleware APIs in terms of like uh, web3.js or ether.js so what it do it helps to connect to the blockchain network but when we come when when it comes for uh, azure workbench so you don't need any uh, middleware to connect to the blockchain network because you can uh, deploy a blockchain app directly to the azure workbench uh, in demo we will, we will cover this we'll show you and uh, develop a gateway api to map smart contracts for active directory accounts so you Means like you have to manage your role and access permissions also if you are developing your own blockchain applications. Microsoft Azure Workbench it's already pre-built with your uh, AD uh, configuration, so it allows you also to perform blockchain uh, transactions for the guest users or external parties, and uh, develop a blockchain applications for your interacting with your off-chain storage. Off-chain storage it means uh, basically whatever the transactions you are performing on the blockchain network, so like uh, those transactions are stored in terms of hash, so that is the on-chain storage. But uh, you want to store the data also in your SQL Server database or Cosmos database or any other kind of database. So it is also possible, but uh, for that. Uh, means Azure Workbench, there is a possibility. You just need to uh, enable a few connections to push the data into off-chain storage and you can display a report. So the better use case uh, I find out it was like uh, for a digital, verifi digital uh, document verification. Suppose if you want to uh, means in that there was a SharePoint form and what they used to do, they used to upload the data. So hash used to generate and that data used to store in a SQL Server database, so they they have a complete report for that. So it, it's a quite helpful and useful in terms of uh, creating the off-chain storage. So let's go for Azure Workbench. So in overall picture, if you see uh, Azure Workbench, basically is a integration tool, and it also helps to uh, create a simple prototype or applications uh, to host means like you don't need to worry about the infrastructure part at the end. So if you see here, uh, we have a couple of applications like suppose if you have uh, any .NET app, Java app or any Office 365 app or SAP SAP applications or any client apps and you want to means integrate with your uh, multiple like different type of ledgers like uh, on the other hand you have a uh, like uh, Ethereum network or you have hyperledger or chain or quorum or coda so these are the different types of framework available for blockchain so the, the this is the biggest challenge actually in current scenario because everyone is uh, trying to create a consortium for uh, either for hyperledger or coda or quorum okay but the interoperability between the network of uh, two different ledgers like hyperledger or uh, coda or a hyperledger to Ethereum, it's a very big uh, issue. So Microsoft, what they are trying to do, they are trying to create an ecosystem where all the blockchain ledger platform can uh, integrate with your existing app, and uh, they are do, they are what they are trying to provide. They are trying to provide a complete infrastructure or integration capability in terms of uh, creating the whole ecosystem. So if you can see here, uh, we can. Uh, 
Microsoft Azure is providing for uh, storing your identity and key management by using Azure Key Vault and federated identity data platform by using SQL Server or Cosmos DB and uh, off-chain storage monitoring capabilities and third-party services. So there are a couple of uh, services they are providing inbuilt. So let me just uh, jump into the blockchain uh, Azure Workbench and show you what exactly it is. Okay, so for setting up blockchain, we have a four step process like uh, first we need to set up an Ethereum network and then we need to register uh, AD tenants. So AD tenant will be helpful uh, because you will be administrator for the network and whoever a participant is uh, registering on your network. So you will know. So that is uh, called a proof of identity. So that is one of the consensus mechanism for the blockchain network. And then we deploy the blockchain as your workbench and uh, blockchain application. So in registering an AD, it's not necessary that uh, tenant should be on the AD network. It can be external. So there is a process you can allow uh, external parties also to perform the transitions on the network. And that is uh, done by uh, SS, I mean, service principle. We'll show you. Okay. So overall, if you can see here, uh, we have uh, client apps. We have external parties and this used to be a I mean, like other blockchain networks. So client apps and external parties used to communicate uh, via APIs like public APIs and private APIs to the blockchain network in uh, when you are going to create your own blockchain network. What ex exactly uh, Azure Workbench is doing? It is going to replace this part uh, blockchain network with the Azure Workbench and on Azure Workbench we are uh, uh, hosting our smart contracts, app services, and SQL Server, all the services are there. So let me show you on the portal itself. So you need to go in the create resource and uh, there is a blockchain. So blockchain, there are a couple of options if you can see here. Uh, one is the Azure blockchain as a service, which is still in preview mode, public preview. So public preview is uh, for uh, like a development uh, means purpose or prototype and uh, but yeah still we need to see for how it's ready for production okay and uh, as your workbench and there are a couple of templates actually so these are the ethereum templates hyperledger quorum so these templates are the predefined templates so this is something like uh, microsoft azure is providing a pre-built infrastructure for creating a Ethereum network, for creating a Hyperledger network, of creating a Quorum network. So it's up to your choice. Okay. For Azure Workbench, you need to go and create your, uh, choose your subscription. Then you need to fill all the details like resource group, region, and uh, prefix, VM usernames, authentication type, what type of authentication you want, and you need to fill your uh, password details and database and blockchain password. This database and blockchain password will be required at the time of when you want to see your off-chain storage data. Means whatever the transaction I'm performing on the blockchain network, but I want to see this data on some SQL Server database or uh, Cosmos DB. So in that scenario, for this is for the SQL Server database. So you need to for login into SQL Server database, you need to enter the password here and which region you want to deploy. Advanced settings, we have a couple of options like uh, create new and use existing. Create new will be suppose if you are going to create a network first time. So it will be uh, you will choose a create new and you will be administrator for that network. But if you have suppose if you have any existing blockchain network available and uh, Ethereum network, so you can provide a Ethereum RPC endpoints address here and you can uh, join the network from directly from here. Azure Active Directory settings, so as I showed in my uh, slides, we this is the, f so when uh, we will set up the AD later, so after filling all these details, we will just create a review and create, and the blockchain will be deployed. It will take almost 30 minutes to deploy the blockchain, and after that, we need to set up the AD tenant. So AD tenant will be basically on your uh, Active Directory. So I have already Active Directory available uh, on my name. So you can see I have already added some of the users. Okay, but uh, 
for adding your uh, Active Directory, you need to register your blockchain app. So after deploying your blockchain, uh, so you can see here, this URL you will get means like something something similar to this. Okay, so this is the blockchain uh, workbench. Here, uh, what we can do, we can deploy a blockchain app, sample app, prototype, and we can add multiple users, and we can perform the transaction. We can test the blockchain app. So this is very helpful because in few minutes, you don't need to create an infrastructure. You don't need to create a UI. What you can do, you can just write your business logic in terms of uh, smart contracts, and you can deploy on blockchain by just click on this and you need to upload your JSON file. So JSON file is nothing but your uh, uh, ABI file. Basically, uh, it is a blockchain uh, uh, description file for uh, your smart contracts, like what is your metadata and what is your roles and uh, your uh, workflows. All the things will be uh, de means described in the JSON file. Uh, so let me show you how the JSON file looks. So if you can see here, this is my uh, blockchain Azure Workbench uh, JSON file. So if you can see, this is the metadata, application name, description, display name. Sorry, and description. Can you yep. zoom in a little bit? Oh, okay. The font is very small. Uh, come on plus. Is it okay? Yeah, and maybe you can also do Control B or Command B just to keep the file open. Okay. Command B. Command B. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So this is uh, thanks. Uh, so this is the metadata, and uh, here we have defined all the application roles, and uh, these are the all workflows. So if you can see, uh, we have uh, for the Hello blockchain, we have a for the requester and responder and uh, request message and respond message. So all the functions and what are the types. So we need to define in the JSON file, the ABI file. And uh, then there will be a uh, blockchain contracts in the smart contracts. The good thing is when you are deploying for the Azure Workbench, so you don't need to means specify all your uh, roles and access, all such informations. So that's why uh, it is uh, very easy to write a business logic for the Azure Workbench. So you can see I have a send request and send response. And when I will uh, deploy this smart context, let me show you how I can deploy. I will come here. My session. So this is my JSON file, which is my all. Uh, and next I will deploy my smart contracts. So if you can see uh, how quickly uh, my blockchain application is uh, ready to test. So I have a role. Suppose I want uh, my role uh, myself. Requester. And uh, demo one, the responder. Okay. So now my uh, I can high blockchain. So this is quite helpful in terms of uh, you want to test your business logic rather than uh, worrying about your. Uh, means UI and your infrastructure part. So this is very helpful uh, to test your uh, means like you can just go and you can see from where to where the transaction, how what is the contract address, who have performed and what are the actions performed. So everything we can see here. And now let me come to my. Uh, as you Oh, 
So if you can see here, I am in now in a uh, responder. So this is so I will take action. I want to respond this message. Thanks. So it is creating on the blockchain network. So that's why it's taking time because it is checking your previous history. So for the blockchain, if you can see here, I have a request message and then responder who have performed the thanks response message. Yeah. So this is uh, very helpful for uh, creating a prototype. OK, so, so for uh, Con configuring the AD, so you need to register your app. Actually, this is a couple of steps process. You need to do a app registration. Like uh, I have a blockchain API, so I need to create my. You have to modify your roles like app roles and uh, you have to. There are a couple of settings you need to do. So what you can do if suppose if you are uh, interested to configure a blockchain uh, app, I have created a. I have created a Azure Workbench tutorial for that. So this is a Azure Workbench tutorial with the video. So cup all the steps. So what are the needed? It, it it takes time actually for almost one hour to configure. So you can see here. Uh, let me show you all the resources for uh, block Azure Workbench, whatever is created. So I have a. This is my Azure Workbench. So when Azure Workbench will be deployed, you can see here. This is my app service and this is my API. So API will be helpful for uh, suppose you want to integrate uh, any existing applications like uh, .NET application, Java applications. So you have a Swagger APIs. So all the contracts are here. So you can perform the transaction on uh, by using this API and it will be a uh, transact on this uh, Azure blockchain network. OK, we if you can see here, uh, we have also uh, even grid key vault. Key vault will be useful for restoring your uh, private and public keys. And uh, this is a public IP address. And there is also SQL Server and SQL Server database. So let me show you uh, all the transactions, whatever we have performed on the blockchain workbench how we can see on the SQL Server database. So before uh, going to the SQL Server database, you need to uh, enable the firewall rule. Otherwise, uh, you will not be able to interact. So let me show you. Yeah. So we need to add the client IP. And. Uh, yes, make sure you have allowed this allow Azure services and resources to access this server. It means you have to allow uh, all the Azure services to interact with your uh, means of database for this. So means suppose if you want to perform the transition by using logic apps, so it will be uh, after performing the transition, it will be saved into the SQL Server database. Yeah. So in the SQL Server database, we have a couple of options here. Uh, we can see here query editor. So you can see here we have all the tables. So we have. Uh, Contracts. I have performed two transactions for the asset transfer and uh, for Hello Blockchain, and uh, we have how many users? So I have uh, almost six users. Five. Yeah. Demo one. These are my users. All my transactions. We can see here. So this, all the transactions data and report you can uh, miss. Create a Power BI report. You can uh, also display in some other applications. So it's up to your choice how you want to use this data. Okay, let me uh, quickly show you uh, what is the technical architecture for this. So basically, 
this is the app. What we are doing, app is interacting with the public or private APIs to the API service gateway, and uh, then the transitions, all the transition is managed by using service bus, and then it's uh, going to write on the blockchain ledger network. So all the keys, private keys, will be managed from the Azure Key Vault, and uh, we have a DLT ledger consumer, so which is keep on watching all your transactions data. And uh, all the if you want to store uh, off chain storage, so it will be available in uh, Azure uh, SQL Server database or Cosmos DB. So this, uh, this is Azure uh, means Workbench integration. So how the integration happens? Suppose if you have any existing app, and if you want to uh, like a, if you have a means uh, existing app, your uh, means. Uh, for your uh, like .NET app or uh, Java app, and you want to perform the transactions on blockchain network. So what happens is uh, all the connections are managed by a private API. So you need to authenticate first your uh, Active Directory account because Azure Workbench is uh, fully managed from using as Azure Active Directory. It will uh, return a request token, and uh, if the token is valid, so you can call the API. Gateway Service API, and uh, it will send the message to the ledger by using Azure Service Bench. Uh, from Azure internal database, it will uh, retrieve all your trans details and return the data. So for it's suppose if it is an external user, so that happens by using a service principle. So in that, it will create a guest user uh, ID by using service principle, and then it will request the, for the token and will return the data. So if you want to interact on the blockchain network, so the best, uh, the better way is uh, go using the APIs. So what it ha helps is uh, suppose if you want to uh, later on, if you have decided for your blockchain app to not use the Azure Workbench, so it's still your uh, all the business logic in terms of a smart contract is written and it is. Uh, uh, Communicating by API, so backend uh, as either it's Azure Workbench or uh, either Ethereum network, so you can replace anytime. Public APIs basically is uh, by using Azure Workbench and uh, sorry Azure Web Apps and Azure Functions, so you can uh, interact by .NET Core APIs, Python or whatever. Okay, for smart contracts logics, basically uh, we write in Solidity. Solidity is a programming language for writing the smart contracts, Ethereum smart contracts. And uh, for deploying on the Azure Workbench, actually this is the tricky part, the configuration file. Configuration file, as I showed you before, uh, this is a JSON file, configuration file. So this is different from your uh, means normal blockchain application uh, ABI file. In that, basically you need to define your metadata, your application roles and workflow. But when we same, let me show you. One minute. Yeah. As it transfer. Yeah. So suppose if you same hello work, uh, uh, hello blockchain application I have created in. Uh, uh, VS code. So if you can see here, my uh, this JSON file is completely different because whenever we are uh, going to create any new blockchain application, so after building the contract, smart contracts, the ABI file is generated. This is called uh, hello blockchain JSON file. So it keeps all the information of, regarding the smart contracts. But this smart contract, this ABI file and uh, Workbench API file is completely different. So when we are going to deploy a blockchain application on Azure Workbench. So we need to generate this. Uh, we need to create this uh, ABI file in that we need to define this a, some particular format like application name descriptions or application roles. So and uh, workflows. What it helps is. Uh, you don't need to. Let me show you my. Uh, crud application. Sorry, one minute. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
this is my to do list application. So in that uh, I have uh, defined all the means like my variables and events and the constructor and if I whoever is going to perform the transactions. So we need to define the roles. We need to check the roles, but when we are uh, going for Azure Workbench, so everything shifted to, to this uh, configuration file. So all the applications roles and everything will be defined here. So. Whenever we are going to upload this file, so it will check. Uh, means who is the requester who is respond responder all the application roles will be available there and we can define the role from there. Like uh, example for the hello blockchain application. Uh, I when I have uh, create uploaded the smart contracts. There was uh, there was no members, but I have defined the members based on my roles. So like risk request and responder. So this requester and responder will be available in a JSON file. But when you are going to create a normal smart contract uh, by using from VS code, uh, this JSON file will not be generated. So you have to specify all those settings by yourself. OK. So in my previous demo, uh, previous part one, I have uh, mis explained means like how we can uh, there was a asset transfer app. This is asset transfer app in that there was a four members four members. One was buyer, one was appraiser and inspector and owner. So owner have rights to create a new trans asset transfer so I can create a new asset transfer like suppose I want to sell uh, mangoes. And boy price 1500. So I can perform the transactions. Same as it is uh, the other like a demo one will be a buyer and uh, he will bid the price like he want uh, means mango on suppose on 120 USD. So in that case he will take the action and then there will be he will assign appraiser and uh, inspector to verify the transaction. So you can see here. I make offer take. I need to is inspector appraiser offer is 120 like that. So. In. Uh, for. For business logic, we will write all uh, like who means whatever the transitions we are like we are going to terminate. We are going to modify or we are going to make the offer. We are going to accept the offer reject accept all the business logic we will write in the smart contract solution file and roles who is going to perform what we have to define. This is a application roles appraiser buyer inspector owner and the workflows like asset transfer what it handles. He is the initiator owner. And what it do it starts so it's active. What is the property? Uh, description asking price offer price. So all this uh, attributes we need to define here. This is the so this is big major difference when we are uh, going for uh, means uh, creating a blockchain application from scratch and uh, when we are going to deploy a blockchain prototype on Azure Workbench. So on Azure Workbench, we will just create a solution file and uh, all the properties will define in JSON file and will upload in uh, Azure Workbench and we can test all the functionalities from end to end. And even though we have a blockchain API. Blockchain API to test that sub suppose if any external user wants to perform the transaction so they can consume the API and they can perform the transaction on the API means on the blockchain network. But while we are going for uh, creating blockchain app uh, from. Let me 
me close everything first. Yeah, so this is my uh, to do list applications in that I have created everything from scratch. In that what I'm doing is uh, I want to add the list based on uh, like suppose I want to. This is my to do list application which I have deployed uh, from scratch. So what it what we need to do is. Uh, for creating a this application from scratch, we need to set up our blockchain network. We need to install few tools like Ganache, Node.js, Truffle, and uh, we should have a like a MetaMask plugin. So MetaMask plugin is uh, basically help to interact your blockchain application to the means your app to the blockchain network. So I have a blockchain app, this one, and this I want to interact with your blockchain network. So this MetaMask plugin will be helpful for adding this. And Ganache is basically for your local host setup. By default, uh, it will give you some uh, test accounts so you can perform the transaction by using Ganache. And Truffle is uh, for your uh, code management uh, kind of tool. So what you can do is uh, suppose I want to create a project. So it is started creating the project. If you can see here, there are there is a migration contract and uh, so you can write your own smart contract. I have written for a to do list. So this smart contracts I want to deploy on uh, Azure Workbench or Azure uh, Blockchain as a service. So for uh, deploying on Azure Blockchain as a service. We have a blockchain network here, so you can see here uh, Azure Blockchain as a service option is showing here. I have already uh, created a blockchain uh, consortium, but when you go for uh, Azure Workbench, Azure Workbench also So this is a uh, app service. This is nothing but your Azure blockchain as a service. So Azure Workbench also uh, provides a means Azure blockchain as a service. So we can also create to this network. So there are two options. One is uh, by using Azure Workbench and second is by using Azure blockchain as a service. So Azure blockchain as a service is helpful when you want to uh, scale up the network and uh, means you don't you want to add more transition nodes. So in term in that scenario means what we'll do will create a blockchain prototype by using Azure Workbench. We will test all the functionality and then we will uh, create a separate project and we will add the smart contract here. And we will deploy on using Azure blockchain as a service. So. This is good for your uh, production deployment or QA deployment. So you can create a blockchain. Uh, what you need to do, you need to create a resource. You need to fill all the. Uh, you need to fill the details by default. It uh, supports Quorum. Quorum is a enterprise version of Ethereum uh, blockchain network, and you have to provide your member details like how many members you want, how many validate. So we, there are two types of tiers. One is a basic tier and one is a standard tier. Uh, basic tiers is uh, nothing but your. Uh, your uh, miss for the test environment, dev, dev and test environment for standard tiers you can run for the production load. So. It is for. Uh, miss scaling up your network for high availability and even though you can uh, add multiple transaction nodes. So validator node will be helpful for verifying your transactions and transition node will be for your 
maintaining all your transaction details. So let me quickly show. Okay, let me jump to my slides here. So as I explained before, uh, this is the metadata and this is application roles and this is the bug flows. So what the problem we get is uh, means, uh, this is the basic results like uh, when we are going for a blockchain workbench, so we don't need to write the role verification in the smart contracts because uh, all the roles we have already defined in the uh, ABI and JSON file and the array structure like defining your uh, uh, defining your uh, parameters, those all things can be removed. So it helps to uh, become the code become lighter. And uh, when you are performing the trans transaction on the blockchain network, it uh, it is a less price. But uh, and uh, roles verification migrated to the config files and now workbench can be mutually shared with the uh, smart contracts. So we just need to worry about the business logic part. But there are some uh, pros and cons for both the scenarios. Like if you are writing your uh, blockchain network from scratch, so you have uh, control over the network and you can uh, add smart contracts and you can write whatever you want. Okay, but uh, when you are going for uh, the blockchain as to workbench, so it gives you a flexibility to the whole network and uh, integrating your apps. There are a few things which we need to consider when we are going for Azure Workbench. So for smart contracts, you need to have a Workbench are different simple distributed apps like a smart contracts app and Workbench as I told earlier. It's completely two different things. So smart contracts, ABI file will be different from the Azure Workbench and you have to make sure the naming convention because if you are uh, creating for the Hello Workbench, Hello Blockchain, so the naming of JSON file should be also hello blockchain.json. And uh, use as much as possible workbench uh, native functions. What it means is uh, Azure Workbench uh, provides some native uh, functions and commands. So you have to use more or more like that. So it is similar as Solidity. So you don't need to worry much about that. Okay. So let me show how we can uh, create a simple contract. Microsoft actually Azure is providing a couple of uh, blockchain samples on uh, you can find on GitHub. So this is a uh, blockchain samples they are providing. I have downloaded a uh, Hello Blockchain and uh, Asset Transfer. So you can download and can try a uh, different type of uh, blockchain uh, applications. So it will helpful for your uh, to understand the way of writing the code and uh, yeah. So let me show you. I was going to create a. Yeah. So in Azure Development Kit, we have an option for creating the project. So you can choose here directly new Solidity project. But before that, you need to uh, download a blockchain development kit from Azure. I have already downloaded, so it will give you two options. One is for a basic project, and second is uh, from the truffle box. So what a truffle box is? Uh, truffle box. So there are a couple of samples on the truffle suit. So you can see here uh, there is asset transfer. There's a list locker or a couple of D apps which is already uh, 
open source and uh, which is pushed to the truffle box. So you can try one of the app by using uh, either you can choose from the create project from truffle box. So you need to provide suppose I want to create for a digital locker. So I need to provide this option. A basic project, it will create a just a hello blockchain application. So it is creating the project. Some issue. Okay, let me create a simple blockchain application. In this blockchain, so so you can uh, connect a blockchain uh, consortium, but just by click on connect to the network, and once you connect to the network, uh, it will open. Um, Microsoft uh, authentication profile so you can just authenticate and uh, choose the Azure blockchain as a service. All the consortium will be appeared here. So suppose if you have a uh, multiple consortium so you can disconnect one of them and I want to deploy uh, this app blockchain app on this uh, member. So what I will do first I will uh, choose the option for build. So let's my build my contract. Choose as a bunch. So I have option for building the contracts. So my contract is building. If you can see here, uh, by default, there will be truffle and all the prerequisite for uh, creating the blockchain network is already installed here. After building the contracts, the build file will be generated so you can see here this is uh, my blockchain and this blockchain JSON file ABI file is completely different from uh, Azure Workbench JSON file. So, so this ABI file keeps all the information regarding your uh, blockchain app. Now I want to deploy so this is a very simple you can just go and deploy to the network and uh, it will which it will ask you which network you want to deploy. I want to deploy on this network. And my contract is being deployed. So after deploying, will it will generate a transaction hash. So you can see all the details account, which account is going to display it and what is the gas price. Everything we can see here. And this is there are also a couple of uh, good features uh, in upcoming sessions. I will explain like how you want to how you can uh, create uh, API's for interacting your blockchain network and uh, how you can publish by using event publish or uh, how you can publish by using report publishing workflows. There are a couple of good features available and suppose if you want to test this uh, blockchain uh, application. So what we can do is uh, there is a show smart contract interaction page. So what it will do. It will load the interaction page and you can even though test uh, your request or response something like that. So we can perform that. Yeah. So I think uh, I'm almost at my end of my uh, session here. Yeah. So for Azure Workbench and Azure Blockchain as a Service, Azure Blockchain as a Service is uh, very good in terms of creating your prototype and deploying application, managing all the infrastructure, and the uh, Azure Blockchain as a Service is very helpful for your 
scaling purpose if you want to deploy your app on production so this is an azure blockchain as a service provides your capability of uh, azure data manager so it helps to capture uh, all the data from different sources and can push into the sql server database or any other data sources Uh, so if anyone have any questions on this, yeah. Thanks, Asif. While you take up any questions, let me quickly share an update because there are some people who joined late. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see you. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions, guys? So, if there are no questions, then for those people who joined late, uh, this is an, a small announcement for next week's uh, meetup that we have. Uh, this one will be Ask Me Anything with uh, Donovan Brown. So, uh, Donovan Brown is one of the Microsoft Cloud Advocate and a big proponent of DevOps. Uh, I think it would be a good opportunity for you to interact with him if you have any interest in DevOps practices. Yeah, and one more thing, uh, is in upcoming part three, we will, we will be covering uh, deploying this uh, to-do list app or asset transfer app on uh, by using CI CD tools to Azure services. And uh, you can see how we can perform the transitions from there, from blockchain app to the blockchain network. Yeah. If anyone have any questions, you can ping me. We are right within the time. I think as yeah. if you managed the time well, we still have a couple of minutes. So uh, last opportunity, guys, you have any questions for us? If, if not, then we close the session here. Yeah, OK. OK, thanks for uh, joining today. Uh, thanks, Nilesh, for organizing the session. Yeah. Thank you, Asif, for this thanks. wonderful session. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you, Nilesh. Thanks for the session. <clears throat> Goodbye. Goodbye.